All right. Um, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Corbett, who's going to talk to us about kernel documentation. Um, there's been some exciting, exciting uh, evolution there, um, so I'll be really looking forward to this one. And uh, you're, in their wisdom, your organizers have scheduled this one right before tea, so if the conversation wants to spill over, that's also fantastic. Uh, please take it away. All right, thanks. Yeah, I got a lot of talk about it. I hope I won't eat too far into tea time. So let's just get right into it. Uh, I'm talking about kernel documentation. The kernel, just for those who aren't familiar with what the Linux kernel is, of course, the core of any Linux system out there, the kernel is big, right? It has something over 61,000 files stored in over 4,300 directories. We put out a kernel release about every 63 or 70 days with something on the order of 1,600 developers contributing to every release. That's about 4,000 over the course of a year and about 12,000 changes going into every release. So. The kernel, in short, is a very big and very fast-moving project, arguably the biggest and fastest-moving software project out there in the world today. So something like this, one would hope, would have equally big and good and fast-moving documentation. Um, what we have, in fact, is hopefully heading that way, but as you'll see, we have a, a little ways to go. I want to start by just talking about the kernel project in general and how it relates to documentation, then I'll get into the specifics of what we're actually doing. So something that still surprises people to know is that almost all of the code that goes into the kernel is written by paid developers. The, the image of kids in their parents' basements cranking this thing out is, is not something that was really ever true, and it's certainly not true now. Um, this is a slide I stole it from tomorrow's talk, so you have to forget you've seen it by then. <laughs> and, um, this is where, the, where at least some of our code comes from leaving off typically about another 200 companies that contribute to any given kernel release. So the kernel is very much a professional product developed by people who are paid to be doing that work by companies that have some reason for wanting to improve specific areas of the kernel. So um, given that, it's worthwhile to know that, well, this doesn't really apply to all parts of the kernel. In fact, there's, there's nobody out there whose job it is to write kernel documentation. All right, there are various developers who will at times put a bit of their time into creating documentation, but it's often kind of unwilling. Um, at best, they get tired of people asking them about something and still so they'll try to write it up, whatever. But there, there is no documentation team for the kernel. There is nobody who's paid to do it. All these companies that are supporting kernel development don't see the need to support kernel documentation. This is something that you see in a lot of areas of the free software world where there, there are areas that nobody sees as being their problem. And so they, they tend to not be invested in as much as other, other parts of the software ecosystem. This is certainly not unique to kernel documentation. All right, within the kernel, we have a well-defined maintainer model. If we're going to put out a release every nine or 10 weeks, involving 1,600 people or so, we need to have some sort of a way of coordinating all this change going into the kernel, or it's um, going to fall apart very quickly. And in fact, quite some years ago, it did kind of fall apart fairly quickly a few times. So the model looks like this. It's very hierarchical, right? In an idealized sort of sense, we have a whole bunch of developers way over there on the left. They're feeding changes in the maintainers who may then aggregate those, feed them up to higher level maintainers, Eventually, everything gets up to Linus Torvalds, who does all the pull requests that puts things into the mainline kernel. So in a typical kernel release, we have like 12,000 changes. Every single one of those has gone through Linus Torvalds, but it has been concentrated on the way up so that he doesn't have to actually look at them all because uh, he trusts the maintainers who are underneath them. This, this maintainer model, among other things, pretty closely matches the, the file system hierarchy of the kernel itself. So the person maintaining the SCSI subsystem has a directory, which is driver slash SCSI and stuff, stuff underneath it, which is the piece of the kernel that he maintains. This makes the responsibilities pretty clear in general. It also helps to keep the maintainers from stepping on each other's toes because everybody has their own little piece of the hierarchy that goes up there. So the, you know, this hierarchy that I showed you here looks an awful lot like the, the file system hierarchy that actually stores the kernel source code. Um, documentation doesn't really fit this model. Documentation, as you will see, kind of lacks a lot of the organization that we have in other parts of the kernel. It also tends to cover the entire kernel. So I have a big directory full of stuff that is relevant to the whole kernel, so all of the kernel maintainers end up touching it 
at points or another. And I end up, end up touching things that are outside of the documentation tree. So all this organization, which is meant to keep people from stepping on each other's toes, doesn't help me very much. So I end up stepping on toes and getting mine stepped on. And um, I have to do a lot of smiling at the other maintainers to try to keep everything running smoothly. For the most part, it works pretty well. I think mostly because they're really happy that somebody is actually interested in working on the documentation. <laughs> um, but it, ma it makes for an interesting challenge organizationally to make all of this work, trying to juggle things. The other thing that I want to um, point out, you know, the kernel can be thought of as one of the bleeding edge projects of the free software world. We, we blazed a lot of the trails on how this stuff is done. And in terms of scale, we're still way up there. But um, despite that, kernel developers are actually very conservative people. They don't like change. They don't like new tools. They don't like format changes. They don't like heavyweight dependencies and so on. So there was a, a period a while back where we had a developer fighting very hard to remove any traces of Perl scripts from the kernel build process, just because they didn't want that particular dependency in there. Uh, adding other sorts of dependencies is, is sort of a hard sell. So if you want to improve the way we do our documentation, especially if you want to introduce new tools, well, this too can be an interesting challenge to try to get that accepted in the kernel community. But that said, we're going for it. We're trying to, to make things a whole lot better. So what do we have now? If you look at the actual documentation part of the kernel, there's a directory called documentation. It's a top level directory in the kernel source tree. If you actually look at the kernel source tree, there's maybe a dozen directories in the top level. Only one of them ha starts with a capital letter. So that tells us how important documentation is to the development community. Um, there's 2,200 files or so in the documentation directory stored in a couple hundred directories, about 23 megabytes of material in the kernel documentation directory. This is excluding the device tree stuff for people who, are, who know about that. That's essentially documentation for other computers to read and isn't really part of all of this stuff. And there's some stuff outside of the documentation directory, but for the most part, it's there. There's quite a bit of stuff in that directory, split into two basic parts. There is about 2,000 plain text files, just something or other dot text in there. Some of them are quite comprehensive and useful, a lot of good information in them. Um, some other ones, well, um, no. Some of them, for example, have never been changed in the entire time that the kernel has been stored in a Git repository. Um, there's, there's some pretty crafty stuff in there. Alongside that is a directory called docbook. It has, um, at the time of this writing, it had about 34 template files in there, which are docbook documents with some extra um, magic in them. That is used mainly to pull information directly from the source code. So we can generate these 34 books, grabbing a lot of documentation that's actually stored in the source itself. I'll show you how that works. And this can be rendered into various formats like PDF, HTML, and man pages, and all that. So we've got these two pieces of the, of the documentation directory, plus um, one other component, which is a whole lot of comments located throughout the source code itself. We call these kernel doc comments. People who have seen this stuff will recognize something that looks an awful lot like what Doxygen uses. That was kind of the inspiration for it, but it's not Doxygen, it's our own special thing. They, they all start with this slash double star marker, and then the format's pretty obvious, right? We're, you have a function here, a very simple function with a couple of parameters and a description of what the, f the function does. So most of the, these comments are describing functions, but they can, in fact, describe data structures or there can be just loose stuff with theory of operation, that sort of stuff, also stored within the source code as well. And if you go and look in the kernel, there's about 55,000 of these kernel doc comments throughout the kernel source. So lots, lots of documentation stored within the source code itself. So just to summarize it, about 2,000 text files, 35 books, 55,000 comments. So we have a lot of documentation. It cannot be said that the kernel does not have documentation. We do have it. It's just that perhaps um, it's not quite what we would like it to be. So what's the design? We were just talking about information architecture and so on. What is the architecture of the kernel documentation? Um, well, there is none. I mean, this, this is really pretty literally true, right? Things just get thrown in wherever and whenever uh, um, they want to and get left there for years. In fact, the guy who just walked into the room once said, um, 
described the whole thing this way. He said, it's a gigantic mess organized based on where random passersby put things down last. And he said this 10 years ago almost, but it hasn't really changed. It describes it very well. Um, and one of the best ways to see this is to just go to the documentation directory and type ls. Anytime you see a directory that looks like this, you just you know you're in trouble, right? This, this is not something that's meant for people to find things. Um, you know, I mean, grep is just not an information architecture tool. So, <laughs> um, but that is how we use it. So you go and you have a directory that looks like this, and it has all kinds of stuff in there. For example, if you look over here, there's a thing called memorybarriers.txt. This file, I mean, it will fry your brain to read this file, but there is nothing better in terms of how to do concurrent programming on, on shared memory systems anywhere on the planet, I don't think. It's written primarily by Paul McKenney and others. It's, it's an amazing document, but it is, it is intense. Okay. Over here is a thing called Zorro.txt. The Zorro bus was the bus on Amiga systems back in the 1990s. Um, this, this is one of these files that hasn't changed over the entire Git era of kernel documentation and probably has not been read. Um, there are some interesting spider webs. And I mean, you can go through, there's some of the stuff here is crucial. You have to read it. A lot of it is junk and it's all kind of mixed together. Some of it is aimed, most of it is aimed at kernel developers. Some of it is aimed at system administrators trying to configure the kernel. And um, some is aimed at application developers trying to use specific kernel interfaces. And it's all kind of jumbled together. There's no, no sort of sense of who the, the audience is or trying to make it easy for any specific audience. So as I was trying to think of the best way to describe this, the, the analogy that I came up with that fits best is my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> There's, there's useful stuff in here, right? But you really don't want to go in looking for it um, <laughs> unless you really have to. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, the other problem here, besides everything I've said so far, is that there is no sense of integration of, of our documentation at all. There are 2,000 files. There are 34 template files. And each one is its own little documentation island. There's, there's no way of doing cross-references, even in the doc book part of it. And there's, there's very little even sort of textual references between them. There's, there's no integration. It really is 2,000 individual documents thrown into a big sort of steaming pile over here. So that's what we got. So this is true even of the doc book part, the formatted documentation, which you might think of as being the direction we are trying to go, because there are some advantages to this, right? It's, it's really nice to have the documentation in the source because it's often right where a developer looking at the source code will be looking to find it. There's also this, this nice idea that when developers change the code, they will change the documentation that is right there next to it to match. This is a pretty optimistic view of kernel development, but it does sometimes happen. Um, it does sometimes happen. It helps that way. The docbook stuff allows the creation of somewhat integrated documents to a point but each one of these 34 template files is still its own silo, all that stuff. We can have lots of output formats, and there are people who want to improve this part of the world. So um, there is some good stuff there, but um, as you can imagine, I'm leading up to something here. Imagine that you took the kernel development community. You know, these are, we're, we're kind of challenged people in a whole lot of ways. And you sell to this community, go through and make your own documentation system, build it yourself. That's going to go through and do all this formatting, all this, all this nice stuff. Um, what kind of system do you think you're going to get? Well, we got it, <laughs> right? Um, what we have is, is something that was hacked together by people who really wanted to be working on something else. And they made it work, and it kind of works sort of, and that's where we start. So, Let's just talk very briefly about how it works. If you type make HTML docs, it's going to go through and it's going to format all of those doc book files into, into HTML so you can read it in your web browser. So these template files look like this. I just grabbed a little bit of it. And you see a mixture of what's just plain old ordinary doc book and these weird lines here that are telling it to go and extract information from the source, get, get the documentation for specific functions. So anybody who has worked with DocBook is probably already squirming because um, this is not legal DocBook. 
Okay, it's not going to validate. And so you cannot use any sorts of normal tools that are meant to work with DocBook on them. Right? You can't use a DocBook editor, anything like that. Right? It's our own special thing. And it is truly special. So you type make HTML doc, and it's going to fire up this thing called docproc to actually parse these things. And then this sequence of events happens. So I won't go through it in detail. Let's just suffice to say that it reads the source code file three times to actually get the, the documentation out of it, reformats it, um, stuffs it into the template file, reformats it again to add some cross-references only within the template file, not between them, and then finally feeds the whole mess to, to XML2 to produce the output. So it does kind of work, but it has a few disadvantages, including the fact that it's really slow. It often will take longer to build the documentation than it takes to build the kernel itself. Um, this is not a good thing. Okay, it's quite brittle. It's really easy to break the documentation build. You can make changes to the source code that will break the docs build. And um, let's just say that there are one or two kernel developers who are not very diligent about checking the docs build after they've made their source code changes. Um, and so this stuff goes upstream. And then the docs build breaks, and then I get the nasty note saying that the docs don't build anymore. So um, this, this is kind of a problem. It's very hard to set up and make work. At the Kernel Summit some years back, I asked the group, how many of you have actually succeeded in setting up and building the documentation? And less than half the room managed to raise their hands. Now, again, we're kernel developers. We're challenged, right? We have special needs. But still, <laughs> um, they should be able to set up the documentation build system. And a whole lot of people told me that they had just given up on it. Right? It's a pain. Um, we've got all these kernel doc comments, but there's no sort of formatting in, within them. They're just freeform text. So you can't, um, say, make a table within one of these kernel doc comments or anything else that you might want to do or add references or whatever. It's just text. That's all that's there. And as I mentioned before, there's no integration anywhere in there. It's all a whole bunch of, um, of kind of jumbled stuff. So, yes, Rob? Two other problems. Um, do we have the mic? Um, we should use the mic. Two other problems. Uh, one, if you read the resulting HTML files, some of them are basically just stubs and have been for years. You know, the, the ones that do have good information in them sometimes trail off abruptly, or, you know, there's an intro section that's very interesting, and then the rest of them are like, you know, three lines per supposed chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the documentation is incomplete. <laughs> And the other problem is that if you're reading one of the HTML files, it's not remotely obvious where to find the source that was made from. So that if you do want to tweak something, reverse engineering the build in order to find out which source file that came from or what more context of it, they're, they're disconnected. Let's see what I said about grep before. <laughs> um, so how can we make things better? because we would really like to make things better. So there are a few sort of basic requirements that I had in mind going to this, one of which being to clean up the mess so that you, know, you can actually find the floor in my daughter's room, say, or you can find the document that you want, create some organization there. We want better formatted output with a more rational tool chain, preferably one that we didn't build and have to maintain ourselves. And um, this is a really crucial one for the, for the kernel world, is that the, the plain text nature of the documentation must stay that way. Right? If we said, OK, we're going to turn everything to DocBook, or if we said we're going to do everything in LibreOffice, um, we'd have a new documentation maintainer very quickly, let's say. <laughs> or we would just have no documentation maintainer at all. <laughs> um, so you know, anything that makes writing the documentation even harder than it is now to write a plain text file is something that is going to be very hard to sell to the kernel development community. So that, that's, a, that's a crucial requirement for all of this sort of stuff. So where this current effort started was maybe about a year and a half ago when a group of developers, including Daniel Vetter, who was here at the conference, said they, they wanted to add the ability to do markdown processing within the kernel.comments. They were working in particular about improving the documentation for writing graphics drivers put a lot of effort into that, and it, they found themselves limited by the, the lack of any kind of formatting in the kernel doc comments. They wanted to improve that. So they first started by making it so you could use Markdown, 
This was later switched to ASCII doc for various reasons, and there were patch sets that went around that would allow you know, ASCII doc formatting within the kernel doc comments. So it brought some nice advantages and allowed moving more documentation into the source, which is where they wanted to keep it. Move it away from the doc book world, because there are probably some people here who like doc book, but um, I don't, <laughs> um, and a lot of people don't. I, I find DocBook to be really painful. I did an entire book in DocBook, and I hated it. So hopefully this would lead us to better documentation, and documentation that is more accessible for, for people to work on. But again, there were a few downsides, starting with the fact that we've just added another tool to this whole tool chain house of cards that I was describing before. We've just made it more complicated than it was before, and added some dependencies, which, um, was not a good thing. And these tools, it turns out, didn't agree with each other. We just had trouble, for example, getting an HTML entity from the kernel.comment through ASCII doc, through XML2, and out through to the other side. And there, it turned out there were certain things that just could not be done. Um, it was really kind of painful. We took a slow build system and made it much slower to the point that it could actually take a few hours to build the full set of documentation which was really kind of a non-starter. Still no linkage between documents. And when I said I wanted to install ASCII doc on my Fedora system, it said, okay, that's fine. I need to install these 71 Ruby dependencies, which again is the sort of thing that's really hard to sell to the kernel development community. So, um, so I, I didn't really like this. I really wanted to send something else, which was to dispense with the doc book side of things altogether, get rid of that tool chain use some sort of a simple markup processor, didn't really matter which one, for everything, and try to integrate everything together into a single document tree, or at least a very small number of related documents uh, with a certain amount of organization in there. So that was what I wanted, but that was not what the patch sets that were circulating did. But um, I firmly believe that working solutions shouldn't be blocked just because the maintainer has a gleam in his eye saying, hey, we could be doing things better than this. So as of LCA a year ago, when a bunch of us talked about this stuff, I, I thought that this ASCII doc stuff was going to be merged. That uh, was really the plan. But I decided I could look around a little bit more because I had messed around with a system called Sphinx for a while. People in this room are likely are relatively aware of what Sphinx is. In the kernel community, I generally have to tell them what Sphinx is. Sometimes I have to tell them what Python is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, I mean, Sphinx is, of course, based on restructured text, yet another simple markup language, and it has a lot of advantages for this particular use case, right? It's designed for the documentation of code, unlike the other things. It's got this in mind from the very beginning. And so if you say, well, I would like a, an index of functions, Sphinx knows what you mean, and things like that. It's designed for the management of large documents in multiple files, which neither ASCII doc nor Markdown can do in any kind of convincing way. And um, our documentation, as you've seen, is large and getting larger, so this really matters. It's widely used and well supported, and quite nicely, it's supported by other people, um, which, which matters, right? Because the kernel really should not be supporting its own documentation tool chain. It's just, it doesn't make sense for us to be doing that. And I'll put to all kinds of interesting formats. We added EPUB, which is, is nice to have. Um, I put PDF on here, even though PDF is probably my biggest pain point with Sphinx. Right now, um, I've been pretty disappointed with how that works. I had hoped we could use RST to PDF to do this, and it just it collapses on things way smaller than what we're doing. And so we're back to the LaTeX tool chain, and that's painful. Um, that was 2,000 dependencies on my OpenSUSE system to get the LaTeX tool chain installed. <laughs> yeah, um, anyway, but a lot of people actually don't care about PDF output anymore if they can have the other formats. So um, we're, we're getting by with it. Anyway, so what happened is that I hacked up a really ugly proof of concept and posted it out there. There's a fundamental law of kernel development, and probably beyond just the kernel. It was, I first heard it expressed by Andrew Morton, which says, if there's a job that you need to have done and nobody is stepping up to do it, the thing to do is to post a really, really bad, ugly solution. <laughs> and then somebody will have to fix it. <laughs> It works every time, and it works this time, too. Um, Yanni Nikula. Don't ask questions, post errors. That works, too, yes. So Yanni Nikula took that proof concept and ran with it and produced something that really works pretty nicely. And consensus actually formed quite quickly around this approach, which surprised me. 
I had expected a lot more arguing than we had. So how does this work? Well, the kernel doc comments work as always. Um, we actually had a developer in all of this thing who was, had his own version of, the, of a Sphinx tool chain that involved changing all of the kernel doc comments. There's 55,000 of them, all right, throughout the kernel source. Um, you could try to post that patch. Um, <laughs> I would not do that. Um, right, anything that involved changing all of those comments was never going to go anywhere. So, so they still work as they always did, except that now they can contain restructured text directives as well. So that we have a whole lot more expressive power in the, in the kernel comments than we used to. We also get nice things like cross-references across the entire documentation tree now. Function structure indexes, much nicer output. The, the output from XML2 was readable. You can say that, you could read it. But um, it was not pretty. And um, simpler and much faster documentation build than we had before. And again, a whole lot of it is handled by Sphinx. This includes things like dependencies with the kernel doc comments within the source code. You edit a source code file, it knows which things it has to rebuild from there. It actually works very nicely. So we get relatively nice output. This is just the read the docs theme, right? We've done nothing at all. Nobody has put any effort into making our output actually look good. I think we could do a lot better than this, to tell the truth. But we have this, which when you compare it to what we had before, is, is really just wondrous. And to make it work, all you have to do is to write your restructured text document. Often the documentation that's there is already in something very close to restructured text to begin with. Add a reference to it and that's it. It's really simple. No more doc book, no other nasty stuff. It all just kind of works. Um, as I said, most of our documentation is already in something very close to restructured text. This is just a, a diff of a, of a document that I updated to do this. You don't really need to look at it in detail and see that the changes are minor. For the most part, we're very close to, to being in restructured text already because all these lightweight documentation formats were designed to look like the sort of conventions that we use when we're, when we're just writing in plain old, plain text. So, oh, we do have an interesting extension model, module. We actually have a few of them now, but this is the most significant one that, that Yanni wrote. When you want to include the, doc the documentation for a function w from the kernel source, we now have this Sphinx directive. So you say kernel doc and you give it a file and then some subdirectives telling it exactly what it is that you want to, to extract from the source. So we no longer have these weird include directives that are in a language other than the documentation <coughs> language we're using, right? This is all done in Sphinx. And this is how Sphinx handles the dependencies, that sort of stuff, all that stuff just works. So life has gotten much easier with this uh, scheme that we have now. So this work was merged for 4.8. Um, something like five, six months ago, something like that. In the beginning, we only had a handful of, of Sphinx documents, including a document on how to do Sphinx documentation itself, and the GPU documentation and the media subsystem documentation, um, which doesn't seem like a lot, except that those latter two documents are huge. The media documentation is really huge. So it includes all of the user space API documentation for the media subsystem, media being web cameras, that sort of stuff. And it's an incredibly complex API that's there. So we actually had a lot of documentation in terms of volume, even if it wasn't a whole lot of, of manuals there. In fact, it was so much that when Linus Torvalds released the first pre-patch for 4.8, for the 4.8 development cycle, he noted that over 20% of the entire thing is documentation updates, which again is not a typical kernel development pattern, shall we say. Um, so it got out there and people started messing with it. Mauro, who is the, the media subsystem maintainer and who kind of got dragged into this unwillingly at the outset, came back and said, okay, well, in fact, it makes it much easier to maintain this stuff now. And he's happy. Um, there's a networking developer named Jesper who wrote a document of his own and said, hey, this is great. It combines the best of both two worlds. You get your nice web output and you can track it in the Git subsystem with the rest of the, um, with the, rest of the code. All of this managing documentation like code that we were talking about at the beginning, right, it's all stored in our same Git repository. It's all just plain text. So people seem to be pretty happy with it. I've gotten a few complaints. 
But um, some of those were from people like Christoph Helwig, who, if you know, is kind of, he's supposed to complain. That's his role. <laughs> um, so moving on in 4.9, we started adding some other documents, including um, one that I called Driver API. I created this. So we started with one of the docbook template files. It was called Device Drivers that just pulled together a lot of the APIs that are used by device drivers, which, of course, is a huge part of the kernel. And then um, added various text files to it. So the way it worked was to start by converting this template file over to restructured text. We have a little script that does this. Really, it's a, usually a pretty easy conversion to do, um, to do that. And then just as an example of the way I wanted this to go, HSI is the high-speed serial interface. It's just a, a serial bus. You don't really need to know about what it is. But it was documented inside this device driver's template book. And that was where the, the APIs for the HSI support functions were found, and that sort of thing. But we also had a plain text file called hsi.txt, where somebody, probably somebody else, put some other related information about the HSI subsystem. So we had these two things totally separate from each other. They didn't reference each other. Uh, again, it was very typical of how kernel documentation has been done. So I converted that over to, to restructured text and merged it together. It took me maybe 15 minutes to do this work. And I put it out there and I sent out the patch and the HSI maintainer came back and said, hey, thanks for doing that. Um, I like that a lot better. And it's trivial to do. And it, just, it was an example of how I would like to see us pull our documentation together in a more rational way. It is, of course, just the beginning. There's still, you know, 2,221 files to, to, to work on, um, that sort of thing. So anyway, in 4.9, we had that driver API book. Also created the development tools book. Um, just pulled together information on the various tools that we had, which was, again, was scattered throughout the documentation tree. And added working PDF output at this point, which, as I said before, is kind of painful. For the 4.10 kernel, which is coming out in about a month, this is the current development kernel, created a new document called Process, which is, brings together our considerable amount of documentation on how the kernel development process itself works. We actually have that pretty well documented. We have a lot of stuff, but it was all scattered. So we brought that together. This was um, one of the changes that I was most nervous about because um, Certain of these files, like submitting patches, that, that, that tells how to submit a patch to the kernel. When somebody does it wrong, somebody will always tell them, go read documentation submitting patches. So if I were then to relocate that to, say, documentation slash process slash submitting patches .rst, I was afraid that I would get screamed at. And so I raised this at various meetings, including at the kernel summit, and nobody threw anything. And so we have, in fact, done this. Um, left a couple of pointers behind for a couple of these, like coding style and submitting patches. But for the most part, we've just done it, and nobody's really ye yelling, at least not yet. We added a core API manual for, for other parts of the kernel API, and we started a, what I, we call the admin guide. So remember, we have different audiences for the kernel documentation, but it has never been organized in that way. So now we're trying to create a, a manual for systems administrators people who want to know what the, the, what the boot parameters do, what the module parameters do, what the various tuning knobs do, things like that. Right? We have a bunch of that documentation. If we put it somewhere where they can actually find it, they might actually make use of it. So all of that stuff is, has been merged for 4.10. This will be a lot of document change, documentation changes that we will see there. Um, future work includes converting the other docbook template files. We're down to about 26 or 27 of them now. Uh, a fair number of them have been converted. I already have a conversion of another one for um, 4.11. And what I really want to do is to convert them all and just delete the docbook tool chain and forget that it ever existed and make life simpler there. The, the code that actually extracts all these kernel doc comments is called kernel doc. It's a, um, kind of what you expect if you took a bunch of kernel developers and said, make a really big hairy collection of regular expressions and put it in a, in a Perl thing and leave it there for 20 years um, with you know, occasional drive-by changes. Um, it's, it is unmaintainable at this point. So we may actually replace that at some point. There's a developer out there who wants to do that and he has his own version that he's rewritten. Um, so we may yet do that. 
So bring in the plain text documents into the integrated documentation that we're creating, and in general, bring some order to the big mess that is the documentation subtree, and in the end of all of this, create more and better documentation in general. So that is where I stop. If there are questions, I would be glad to answer them. <laughs> so it looked like we had a couple. All right, excellent. Uh, hands, there was one here. So this is Rob Landley, by the way, a former documentation maintainer for the kernel. I could not drink from this fire hose. This man is way, way, way better at it than I was. I, the amount of email you get. Yeah. You're CC'd <laughs> on every patch that touches the documentation directory, the entire patch series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, whoa. Um, my question's about coverage, because there's a lot of stuff. I, I created the kernel.org slash doc directory that I was trying to collect everything together there. And basically, my maintainership of this ended when kernel.org had that break in. And they took away everybody's shell access so that I couldn't rsync a web page anymore. And they went, well, you know, update the web page through Git. Don't you browse the web through Git? I mean, you view Netflix through Git. Git is the only tool that exists. So, <laughs> bit of a disagreement there. Um, but one of the things that I had is I had a bunch of scripts that would go through and like grep for all the syscall define macros to see what is the list of current syscalls, is there any sort of documentation on that. I didn't make a whole lot of, of progress on that, but that's one of the kind of things where you moved the um, kernel parameters file into a subdirectory, but there are recognizable calls that create a kernel command line thing that you can grep for mm -hmm. that, you know, well, which of these actually are mentioned in this file? Um, one of the big things is that there's a whole lot of kernel doc in the kernel that was never referenced by any doc book file. The vast majority of it was dark, and I never figured out how to add it to the the doc book stuff in any reasonable amount. I mean, every time I tried, it just wouldn't build. And mm -hmm. when you get to the point where you've got a lot of RSTs looking at the various ones, how do you, you know, is there a way to automate? Well, these are the ones that aren't mentioned by anything. So it's doc, it, it's, a, it's a kernel doc comment. It just doesn't matter because nothing ever cites it and turns it into a, a file. Yeah, kernel doc has some support for saying these ones here were never used but we don't have that as a tree-wide tool, and it would be good to have. Well, I mean, this C but file, nothing ever references this C file, but it's got kernel mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, it, w it would be good to have, I agree. Um, something for the list. Oops. Hi, John. Thank you for your work. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, I, 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 I think that one of the largest problems we have with kernel documentation is that um, kernel developers do not know who their audience is. Um, I, I, I find the existing documentation that we have inside the kernel contains a mishmash of, um, as you said, information for system administrators, uh, information for people who are using this API, um, information that seemed very interesting about the uh, internal implementation of this API at the time the kernel developer was thinking about it, um, and information that would actually be useful to people who are going to be hacking on this. And it would, it, I, I don't necessarily want to lose some of that because a lot of that is very interesting uh, for its target audience, but it does need to be segregated somehow. And, and I find a lot of it is ending up, a lot of it makes sense to be in the same file. So is, is there some kind of mechanism for splitting that out into different doc books? Well, we don't have a mechanism. I think that kind of has to be done by hand as we look at individual files. And we haven't really gotten into that. That is a problem that we have different audiences catered to in the same file. There's quite a bit of that. And, and fixing that is going to be somewhat labor intensive. But, um, but I think it needs to be done. By, by the way, anybody who would like to contribute to the kernel, you know, there's a lot of documentation work that is really pretty straightforward to do. Um, and I would welcome, welcome help there. The other thing I just mentioned, I didn't mention this, but deleting old documentation is incredibly hard. There's, there's a real sense of, oh, but somebody might want that someday. 
sort of thing. And we don't keep old unused code around, but the documentation, I can't delete it. Somebody always says no. <laughs> All right. Um, um, I'll, I'll just mention, sorry, um, it is tea time, but I'd personally like to stay and ask more questions. Um, so you're certainly welcome to hang around and we can keep the discussion going. But if for some reason you're desperate for a tea, um, do feel free to, to sneak out and come back. <laughs> Ah, okay, and there's a volunteer thing apparently going on. Instead uh, of deleting it, make an archive subdirectory and move I, I've it. I've thought about that, yeah. A graveyard. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, I'm one of your users rather than one of your developers. I um, stumbled on the Sphinx probably at about the 4.8 period. When I first saw it, it looked very underdone because there wasn't much out there. And I must admit, as a user passing through, I saw it and thought, this is something that was started and dropped, you know, one of those projects that mm -hmm. I haven't looked since. So I haven't looked at the 410, but I think it's a great way to go. I mean, we have to have this document sorted out, but I too wonder a bit about everybody looking at, you know, parameter.txt or something like that. You know, if that goes poof, there has to be some link that says go look over there. Yeah, yeah, well for some of the important stuff that's been moved, we added a little file saying it's over here now. Um, for the most part, you know, find or grep will find it for you, and we're kind of counting on people to find some of that. Okay. Anybody else? Um, do you feel that other um, subsystem maintainers need to be a bit more insistent with developers that they actually write slash maintain documentation? Yeah. And if so, like, what's I mean, a useful, <laughs> you know, what, what are mean, useful approaches there for other maintainers to apply with? You know, this, this, is, this is one of these perennial issues in kernel summits and so on of, you know, how do we get even something very simple like if you add a new system call, a man page for the system call, much less more detailed documentation. And we talk about having requirements for all that, but imposing requirements on that whole hierarchy of maintainers is really very hard to do and is not often successfully done. So, you know, all we can do is to apply pressure, and we have made progress on that. Uh, if you look at some of the talks that Michael Karask has done and the work that he has done trying to get new features documented so that we can, you know, find problems with them before th we're committed to them, that sort of thing, progress has been made. But most subsystem maintainers do not insist on documentation changes. It's, it's more the exception than the rule at this point. But we can always hope for, for something better. Hey, John. I've been writing and, and helping teams write lots of drivers the last year or so. And one area where we are forced to write documentation is the device tree bindings. Because um, it's, it's quite structured and you have to write them, otherwise mm -hmm. they can't go in the tree. Um, check patch will warn new developers you haven't put this compatible <coughs> string in documentation, et cetera. Um, so that's one maybe to force people to, to write documentation, having some kind of structured format for it. My, my question was, um, the device tree bindings, uh, are you planning on Sphinxifying those or? No, there's, there's been no thought about that. You know, the, um, the long-term plan is to move the device tree stuff out of the kernel source entirely. But it's been the long-term plan for, well, the long term. And um, I'm not quite sure when, when that may change, but Cool. So, so I, I wouldn't invest effort in that in, right away, at least not without hearing from the device tree people that they've changed their ideas. Cool. Thanks. And another one, um, when submitting patches moved, as in the documentation, that was pretty annoying. Um, we had lots of links to that in various uh, project documentation to say, you know, as a newbie, here's where you go. And um, I was just trying to Google for it just then, just to kind of see if my point still was valid. And yeah, it's hard to Google for now. Um, we, well, we, we come I across mean, all these other projects. The there patches. is still a file there, right? Yeah, it doesn't show up in Google anymore for some reason. I, like, U-Boot does and others do, but not as anymore. Huh. Thank you. Uh, part of the reason Google can't find it is that kernel.org slash doc doesn't link to the, it has the capital D documentation under that, but it, it's not linked from the page above. So I think Google's trawling doesn't actually traverse the directory and it doesn't get indexed. So you link to old, you, you link to other people's mirrors of the kernel instead, which tend to be stale. 
Okay, yeah, that, that's something I'll look into. But I, I did have a, another question, which was, do you still get the epic bike shedding every time you propose a fairly simple cleanup and everybody thinks, oh, I know how to do documentation, so let me give 37 different opinions on, you know, I, I posted a thing trying to take all the, just the serial drivers, that there were like nine of at the top level and move them to a serial subdirectory, and that turned into a 30 post thread of people arguing that I was doing mm -hmm. it wrong. Moving yeah. files. I've, I've had relatively little trouble with that. And I've tried to proceed with a fairly light hand and, and to go slowly and so on. But I think people do generally understand the advantages of, of a better organization there. So I've, I've not had too much trouble. Like I said, the biggest problem I've had is in deleting stuff that um, you know, it makes no sense at all. You know, there's a document on how to apply patch to your 1.1 .1 kernel. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, and I wanted to get rid of that, and people say, no, no, you know, somebody might still find this useful, because it... Because it doesn't exist or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it, it's interesting how much resistance there is there. All right, well, I, can we please thank John again? That was really great. <laughs> thank you. All right, and it is indeed tea time, so feel free to harass him further out in the hallway.